If you have your Bibles, what, what I want to do, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2. Just for a few moments this morning, I, I want to lay a foundation where I believe the direction of God in the next few days as God allows me to speak in the next few services, I, I believe that God would have us to begin in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Now we understand in the context of the scripture that Peter is writing to the suffering believers. Do we realize the example of the child of God, the reason that we are called Christians, we are to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not about religion, it is not about a man, but it is all surrounded by the cross and by the blood that Jesus shed upon that cross. He paid our sin debt in full, so now we are to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do, do I realize as a follower of Christ that he is my example. I began to ponder this three weeks ago in my mind and in this particular study. It's an amazing thing that Christ is to be the example of every child of God, every born again believer, yet Christ never sinned. Christ was tempted in all ways, in all points, but yet without sin. And though I am to follow the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know in myself I will fail him. I know in myself I will mess up daily upon my life. But as I am looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, I must follow the steps of Christ. Now, we understand in the book of 1 Peter, in this particular epistle, in the historical setting of 1 Peter, Peter. It is outside of the background of the book of Acts, early in a period between the close of Acts and the exile of John on the Isle of Patmos. The author, Peter, writes to the persecuted believer, and the identification of the persecution is involved crucially in the historical setting of this epistle. Do you realize in the first century believers that many of the first century believers that would read this epistle they would die for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many that would read for the very first time the words that we will read in these next few moments, they would be burnt at the stake. They would have their head cut off, not for what they have done wrong, but simply for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must understand while studying the book of 1 Peter, it is crucial in the interpretation that he is writing to the suffering believer the persecuted child of God. Now, I encourage you this afternoon to read the first chapter of 1 Peter and then the first two paragraphs in 1 Peter chapter number 2. But allow us to begin reading in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 11. I love the language of the Bible. Watch the word of God. Peter said... Dearly beloved, it is a spiritually intimate setting to the children of God. He is writing to those that have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So as he is referring to the child of God, dearly beloved, I, I beseech you, I beg you, I am pleading with you. But look who he's pleading with as strangers and pilgrims. He is reminding them that this world is not our home. He is reminding them though they will suffer, though they will be persecuted, this is not the end. This is not the last chapter. Can I say to every Christian in the Middle East, can I say to every Christian that's now in the United States of America, we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. It is not a political battle that we are fighting. It's a battle of good and evil, good versus bad, and let us be weary and let us understand and let us focus our minds on the thought that we are pilgrims and we are strangers, we are citizens of another land. So Peter is reminding the suffering believer that we are just strangers, we're just pilgrims, and then he reminds them, watch verse 11, abstain, I love that word, from fleshly lust. Why? They war against the soul. 
They, many of these church readers did not understand that they were preparing to step in one of the greatest battles of their life of good and evil. They were preparing to give their life for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter said, now that we are on the battlefield, now that we are warring against these things that we never imagined, we never dreamed, we must live holy, we must live right, we must live pure. And can I say to the child of God, that's in the United States of America. It is not time to battle each other. It is time to live right. It is time to live pure because what we have done, we are warring against the soul when our battle is on Satan, our battle against his evil. Do you understand this morning? We are in spiritually the greatest battle of our life. So Peter said, live holy, live right, live pure. Watch verse number 12, have your conversation. That simply means your conduct. Honest <laughs> among the Gentiles. Why? That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so, watch this phrase, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence, I love this, the ignorance of foolish men. You know what he just said? He said to those that are about ready to burn you at the stake, to those that literally want to chop your head off, he said submit to them, keep your testimony right, be a good citizen in your land and can I say to every child of God we're still believers, we're still representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't like what they're doing, I don't like the laws that they are passing but I'm not representing them, I'm representing the King of Kings and the Lord of all Lords, we are children of God that's striving in this world, now watch the Bible, notice the word of God, verse 16 that's free, not using your liberty that refers to your grace for the cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And he told this to a group of believers that were preparing to die because of their government and their religion. So watch the Bible. Notice the word of God as we lay this foundation in verse number 18. Can I say something about the commandment of following Christ? Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also, I love this word, to the forward. That literally means the harsh, the hateful. When they say things in the wrong attitude, in the wrong spirit, but still have an attitude and the mentality of being a servant, still have the attitude and the mentality. It doesn't matter how they say it. It doesn't even matter why they say it. We are still the children of God. We still represent the Lord Jesus Christ. We are still followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to obey them that are nice and that have a humble attitude. But you know what Peter said? The forward, the hateful. The harsh children of God. Number one, that's the commandment in the introduction. But number two, look at the conscience in verse number 19. Why do we do this, Peter? For this is thank worthy. I love that word. It literally means commendable. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffer wrongfully, uh, if you have lived right, if you have lived pure, if you are living holy, uh, it is thank worthy in the sight of God, uh, in the conscience of man, uh, and in the conscience of God uh, that we keep our testimony. Uh, we still live right. Can we say it this way uh, in the foundation this morning? Uh, we're not living right to get to heaven, uh, but we ought to live right because we're on our way to heaven. Uh, we represent him. Uh, we ought to live for him. Uh, we ought to act for him. Uh, whether you're at your jobs, uh, whether you're at your house, we are still the children of God and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a commandment. There's a conscience. But number three in the introduction, notice what is commendable in verse twenty. For what glory is it, you have memorized this verse, if when ye be buffeted or beaten down for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. 
It's a higher plane of your testimony. It literally means this. If I do something wrong, I deserve it. If I mess up in my life and I have to suffer the consequences, it's because of what I have done. But you know what Peter said? There's no glory in that. But he said when you're living right and you're living holy and they're condemning you on social media, they're mocking you on Twitter and every other platform. They, he said, here's what's commendable. Here's what's thankworthy to God. You just keep on serving Jesus. You just keep on living for God. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. That's what God expects us to do. That is commendable in the sight of God. Can I say number four? And here's the message. Here's the introduction to this particular series. Number one, notice the call of the followers of Christ. Verse number 21, for, I love this. For even hereunto, where are you called? It's emphasis. As a matter of fact, one said it this way. It's double emphasis in this particular phrase. For even hereunto, child of God. Why? Because Christ also suffered for us. What did he do? Leaving us an example. Here it is. That ye should follow his steps. Today, as we begin this particular series, can we step on, number one, the path of suffering? There's many paths of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as God allows us to involve ourselves in the expositional study, we will find that there's different paths and there's different steps in following the Lord Jesus Christ. But before I can ever follow him to an empty tomb, I must follow him to Calvary. Before I can ever have resurrection in my life, there must be a crucifixion in my life. And Jesus said, if you're going to walk behind me, if you're going to follow my steps, it is always a path of suffering. And can I say to every child of God, every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever been saved by the grace of God, there will be suffering in your life. There will be ridicule in your life. There will be pain in your life. If you're following the steps of Christ, this is an example. This is what Christ did and he did it for us to be the ultimate supreme example. He suffered. And if I had decided to live for Jesus, if I had decided to walk in his steps, I too will suffer on the path of Christ. So just for the next few days, as God allows us to deal with these steps and this path of following the Lord Jesus Christ, can we step on the path this morning, remembering that Christ is our example. Everything that we do, everywhere that we go, as a matter of fact, it was Paul that said, follow me as I follow Christ. We must follow in every aspect of our life, in everything that we do, not just in the Jubilee, not just on Sunday morning, but at your job, at your school at your house we must follow the Lord Jesus Christ can I say these three things this morning this particular part of the study and will be done notice the exposition number one look at the Savior's testimony if it is my command my call to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to follow in his steps watch verse number 22 is quoting from Isaiah who did no sin neither was guile that's an amazing word found in his mouth that's an old English word. Our language is so lazy in this day and hour. We don't even use words correctly. But guile, we don't need to change the Bible. We need to change our language. But guile simply means this, no deceit, no deception. One said it's even a deeper meaning than that. In their mind, there's no faults of deceiving. There's nothing inside of you that would ever want to deceive your brother and your sister. So if I'm going to get on this step, if I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm not going to be a good Baptist, but I'm going to be a good Christian, and I'm going to be as close as Jesus as is humanly possible, the very first step. I can, and I should. I can have standards on the outside. I can have everything right on the outside. But if there's any guile, any deceit, any deception, is there any reason as a husband, if there's any deception between me and my wife, if there's any thoughts that's crossing my mind to deceive my wife in any shape, in any form, I'm not acting like Jesus as a father. If I try in any way to make my daughter think I'm something that I'm not, that is guile, that is deception. Why? Because Jesus didn't deceive anybody. There was no guile found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was honest. He was pure. He was holy and the very first step on this path of suffering. No guile. Amen. 
No deception. I don't think we ought to give an invitation at this moment, but we ought to think in our minds, if I'm going to follow his steps, I better get the guile. I better get the deception. How many preachers stand behind the pulpit every Sunday and they make it sound good and they make it sound right, but there's deception and there's guile in their message. How many fathers, they'll show up in Sunday school, but they live a life of deception because of their mind and because of their testimony. How many Christians, they'll put on everything right on the outside, but there's guile and there's deceit on the inside that is not the Lord Jesus Christ. The very, it's a hard one. The very first step. No God. I wonder if I can continue on this path and take another step. But I don't know if I can get past this one. If I want to be like Christ. This week as God begins to move, God will speak in this meeting. God will show up in these services. But I wonder if I'm going to be able to hear him outside of the guile and the deception inside of our lives. If I'm going to allow Christ to be my example, if I'm going to get off my path and I'm going to get off this religious path and I'm going to get on a path headed to Calvary and headed to the path of suffering, there could be no guile. No deception inside of my life. Watch these steps. Step number one, there's no guile. There's no deception. That's the Savior's testimony. But number two, if I'm following Christ, if I'm on this path, there's a sure trust in verse 23 who when, when he was reviled, <laughs> what did he do? He reviled not again, not in return. When he suffered, watch this, he didn't even threaten. He threatened not. One, one ignorant version, very elementary, said, he said, no bad word back. I'm thinking to myself, you have lost your mind. That ain't even close to what the Bible said. To threaten literally means it's more than something vocal. It can become something physical. And you know what the Bible said? Jesus said he didn't even threaten back. He didn't even try to get him back. He didn't say a word that was back. If I'm going to be like Christ. What did he do? He committed himself to him, God, his Father, that judgeth righteously. They spit upon the Savior. They laughed at him. They wagged their heads at him. The Bible said they took the palms of their hands and they beat the darling face of the only begotten Son of God. The Bible said they took a crown of thorns and they planted it upon his head. That literally means they pressed it and they twisted it upon his head. Do you understand this morning? He didn't have to say a word. He didn't have to even bat an eye. He could have thought it and they'd all been dead and in hell without God. The Bible said. He put his trust in the one that judgeth righteously. You say, preacher, but you don't know what they said to me. What did they say to him? Amen. You don't know what they said to my family. What did they say to his family? Let God, if I'm going to follow the steps, not my steps, not, not the way I want to do it, but if I'm going to follow the steps of Christ, it's about saying, God, I'm going to trust you. God, you'll judge them righteously. I don't want to mess this thing up. I want to keep my testimony pure. I want to keep my testimony clean. I know they're lying about you. I know they're condemning you. I know they're criticizing you. But God hears every sound. God hears every word. We must trust in the Father. Amen. Richard, you don't know what they said about my children. What did they say about God's child? There's a short trust. Following the steps of Christ is not about just a suit and tie. It's about trusting him. Even when you're done wrong, even when you're lied about, even when you're condemned for no reason, we'll trust the one that knows all, sees all, and hears all. If I'm going to follow the steps of Christ, if I'm going to get on this path and trust myself to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
We see the Savior's testimony. There's a sure trust. But number three, look at the selfless tree. Verse 24, who is own self bear our sins. Somebody said, why would Peter say it that way? Because Peter forsook him. Peter knew what it was for Jesus to go to Calvary alone. Peter didn't stand behind him, the very author of this particular epistle. He knew what it was. He was there that day, but he wasn't at the cross. He left his Savior. He left the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter said, I know beyond any shadow of a doubt his own self. He went to Calvary. He bled and died for our sins. It's a selfless tree on the tree. Why? That we, verse 24, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. Quotes from Isaiah, by whose stripes ye were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop, overseer of your souls. If I'm going to walk this path, if I'm, if I'm going to follow the steps because he is our example, he is what we are to be as a child of God in every aspect of our life, in every area of our life, it must be selfless. It must be a life that I say, God, not what I want. God, not what I desire. Jesus is getting ready to go to Calvary. Jesus is praying. Great drops of blood and sweat is coming from the brow of the only begotten Son of God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will. Thine, thine be done. Whatever you want, Father. Whatever you desire, God. Can I say it this way this morning? If God is going to speak to us this week like God wants to speak to us this week, I must put myself aside and say, God, not what I want. God, what do you desire? God, what is it that you have? For my life, I've been bought with the price. I've been washed in the blood. It is no longer my life. It is no longer my decision. It is no longer my choice. So if I am following the footsteps of Christ, Father, not my will, but thine be done. At the beginning of this series, we must understand, he is writing to Christians that will give their life for their faith in Christ. He is writing to believers that are not going to be inconvenienced, but that are going to suffer and sacrifice for their faith. Here it is. All of us in this building have been blessed. Every one of us in this building, if we would take the next five minutes, we could stand up and testify to the goodness of God. But I believe beyond any shadow of a doubt, if we don't prepare to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been in a pandemic. We are still at the edge of this pandemic. But we are just seeing the surface of how we could suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I'm going to follow the steps of Christ, wherever he leads, I'll go. God, whatever you want for my life, that's what I'll do. God, this week, where will you lead me? Ali, I want you to come and just sing one verse of this as we close out the Sunday school hour. What is it that God wants for me this week? How, how is it? Brother Zorn will be preaching in just a few moments. How will God speak to me? Will I listen? Will I obey? Will I hear the voice of a preacher? Or will I hear the voice of my Father? Father, help us this week. God, set us on a path. Put us on a journey. Let us follow you in every way. God, whatever that may mean for each individual life, prepare us to follow the steps of God.